I'm going to turn it over to Yerjin, Grant Hernandez, and Daniel Buentello for their demonstration. Thanks for the introduction and uh, thanks for coming. Uh, today I would like to introduce the work which we are trying to identify the vulnerability and the security and the privacy issues in the so-called IoT devices. And as you can find from the title, we are using the Nest thermostat as a testing platform. Uh, this work is done, by, done within the security in Silicon Lab within UCF and uh, it's a collaborative work between the whole lab and between our colleague Daniel. Uh, I will tell you more about uh, each of the collaborators. So as the outline, I will first very briefly introducing the security and privacy of the IoT devices. I won't take too much time, you know more than me. And then I will introduce the, we call it the IoT star, the Nest thermostat. It is very well designed, so we should praise their work. But we will go very deep into the firmware and the hardware. And we will discuss a little bit about user privacy of the Nest thermostat. Then comes the key point that based on our analysis, we kind of like figure out the hardware backdoor and uh, through this backdoor, we get the remote control of the whole device. Then will be some demo. Uh, just in case, because we are setting up a demo here, and we also prepared some video. Just in case the demo doesn't work here, we will show you the video to demonstrate that it's working. <laughs> and then the conclusion. So uh, before I go through the detail of the presentation, I would like to uh, introduce the whole uh, research team. Uh, first is Grant Hernandez. He's a computer engineer undergraduate student uh, at UCF. As you can find that undergraduate student can do a lot. And then is Orlando Arias, and he's not here. I will tell you the reason why he's not here later. Uh, then is Daniel Brantero. He's an independent researcher. He's located in Houston, Texas. And then it's me, Eugene. I'm an assistant professor at UCF doing hardware security research. So as the definition of the IoT, we have done, we've been talking about IoT device for a while, but there are no standard definition. So whenever we refer to IoT device, I always refer to Tesla's quote around 100 years ago. And you can read through it. Uh, this smart guy already foresee the upcoming of the IoT age almost 100 years ago, and now it's becoming true. And uh, we give a very rough definition of the IoT device we call uh, embedded devices with networking capability. Very rough. We're trying to not to put too many words because if we put too many words, then people would argue for that this may not be accurate or not. So, so this is just a thing telling us that since everything is connected, the security and the, and the privacy will be a concern. So we already have a bunch of network device, or we call it smart device, or IoT device there. You can name a lot of them. We know that there are already like more network devices than human population in the world now. So this is just to give us a few examples, saying, telling you that we have smart thermostat, smart camera, smart refrigerator, and there goes a lot of prediction people trying to see that, oh, by 2020, what will happen? So we don't know exactly what will happen, but this definitely tells us that there will be way more network devices by 2020. Someone said there will be 26 billion. Someone said, no, there will be 50 billion devices. But whatever the truth is, what we can say for sure is that by 2020, there will be tens of billions of network devices, and the majority of them is IoT device. So this is, a, a, I would say that it's a very bright future, but it's also a very like horrible future if we think about the security and the privacy concerns. And they already have examples going on here. The thing bot, you have read the news that the, your ref, smart refrigerator can send spam emails. And my colleague Daniel had examined the Wemo and he can remotely control on and off. And also besides 
the security issue, the privacy is even bigger, but it's often omitted by the audience, by the users. The reason is that people kind of like don't care just focusing on the functionality, but not that they care what information has been collected, what information has been uploaded to the server. And if we think that if each one by 2020 will equip like six, seven network device, then all your information will be collected by some company or the government. They know exactly who you are, what you are doing, and what you will do. So this is another topic we will cover in our research work. So then comes that, oh, we select a Nest thermostat, and uh, this is one of the very famous IoT device. Uh, like, they have all the reason to be famous. They're founded by Tony Fadell. He also invented the iPod and the first generation iPhone. And when developed in 2011, in three years, the whole Nest lab was sold to Google for three billion. I mean, uh, one thing I need to mention that when we start working on Nest, we don't know it will be sold to Google. If we know, we would uh, not do research, just buy the stock for it. And uh, uh, we have some older data here, so like 40, but I, I'm pretty sure they will sell more. So now they have been available in UK, and the people around the world are waiting for this device. And the main reason we selected this is from the Tony Fadell's quote. Uh, I will give you 10 seconds to quickly go through that one. A long quote, just to emphasize that they think they take the security into consideration, not like the majority of other IoT devices. They don't really think about security. The Nest thermostat really put security into consideration. And they have the internal hacking team trying to identify the vulnerability. And that's the whole reason that a device like a Nest thermostat, they're so well, very well protected. But let's take a look at it. This is the best protected device. Can we find some vulnerability on this one? If we can, then it can tell, you, tell us the, the fact that even the best protected device have the hardware backdoor we can explore. So here comes the detailed introduction because when we need to, I know you are looking for details, so we will detail the introducing the Nest structure from hardware to firmware and how we identify the backdoor. And at this moment, I would introduce Daniel to tell you more at this moment. One second, guys, I'm gonna get my stuff set up. Uh, So uh, if you're anything like me, you probably forgot what I'm, why I'm up here. So I'll let you guys know. We're going to talk a little bit about the hardware at a very high level at the software and then why it matters, which is, to me that's probably the most important thing is who the hell cares that it has chip X or chip Y. Uh, one thing, just real quick, who here personally owns a Nest by chance? Okay, keep your hands up. Now who here knows someone who owns a Nest? Relat good, okay, so we have, damn, I didn't think there was going to be that many people. <laughs> All right, um, this is good. And it's one thing to keep in mind, if you guys were at the keynote, I don't want to yell at this thing. Um, Dan Greer had mentioned uh, the quote, freedom, security, convenience, choose two. And one of the central themes here, at least for me, before, when I started this, was, um, it wasn't this eloquent, but it was essentially, the more convenient or smart something is, the less secure it is. And that was my entire gist of it, why I wanted to start this and see, what are we giving up? for me just to be lazy on my couch and controlling my thermostat. Uh, so to begin that journey, I had to take it apart. And we'll start with, the, with that. Uh, at a high level, this is the front, front of the, the thermostat. When you're looking at the screen, this is the thing that's right behind it. Uh, the key thing here, and this is, we'll, we'll get to some of these, not all of them, because some of them are, are pretty relevant. Um, the flash, that's two gigabytes. Now, think about it, like two gigabytes, the first iPod had like five or uh, four gigabytes, and this was a music device. It made sense to have five or four gigabytes, however many it had. Why the hell does my thermostat need two gigabytes? What's it doing? And to be fair, it is running Linux, which we'll soon find out, but even then, at least some sort of, hey, this is what we're doing with it. I, I mean, I doubt they would open source this. That'd be great, but at least something has to know, hey, it has this for this feature. Uh, so this was a point of interest of mine, the two gigabytes. Uh, the Wi-Fi radios, or the, the radios were important. 
Uh, we didn't get too much into the Zigbee portion of it, but that's another area that, that I want to get into because the Zigbee, at least, it, it isn't a, a sort of open supported protocol. They made their own protocol. And that's, that's something you should be concerned about because who knows, yes, it is Google and they have all the resources in the world, but it's just one company. It should be evaluated by you know, all of us to, to see how it works. So uh, I think that protocol is called the, the Nest Weave or the, yeah, Nest Weave, yeah. Uh, the, yeah, the, this is the back plate. It, it's pretty dumb in the sense that it doesn't do much. Um, it has its own chip, its own uh, microcontroller. And uh, for the most part, we didn't look at the firmware here. It has its own separate firmware, primarily because uh, you can kind of infer what the hell it's doing. It's going to control the, the wires going in and out of it. It does charge it in a really, really cool way, uh, in case you're interested. What it does is this thing doesn't have a battery. It has a rechargeable battery. So you're thinking, how the hell does it recharge? What it does, it siphons power from your, 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 your coils really, really quickly and charges itself. And, and then it you know, turns off, which is pretty neat if you, if you, I mean, from an engineering pr perspective. I also have some sensors, but uh, that's not important. Um, oh, yeah, so like the Nest Weave, that's what I was talking about. That here's a, uh, um, a protocol that has never been seen before. We've never evaluated. We don't know how it's authenticated. and We don't know much yet. What we do know is that it is used to connect to other Nest devices to form its own sort of symbiotic network where they all talk to each other. Could someone enter that network? How secure it is? I mean, that's all stuff that, that we're hoping to, to get into. So. Once I started taking this stuff apart and seeing what the hell it was doing and look up data sheets, the interesting thing was the, the USB port on the back of it. I don't think I have a picture of it, but some more. You, uh, you think, why the hell does it have a USB port? Uh, like it, it didn't make any sense to me. And turns out that's how you update the firmware in case something messes up. So that's where I started. We, um, well, I'm not going to go that route because it wouldn't make any much sense. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the software. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I'm not going to worry about that. So uh, at a high level, you have the, the Nest Cloud talking to all the Nest devices, right? And your device, which is your phone or whatever, never talks directly to the Nest. So here you have a central point of contact, which is the cloud, and it talks to all these guys. Now, this is where, like, like the real freaky stuff happens where we're sacrificing convenience for something, right? You think, this is great. Nest has all controls, all, all my thermostats. They're going to take care of things. Uh, when we say take care of things, what, what does that mean, right? What, 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 they're just changing my, my temperature. What? No, uh, one of the cool things it does and it advertises is it has this automatic update feature. And I'm going to spend a little bit on that because this is really, really, like, it annoys me how we're doing this and they still don't want to change it. So uh, uh, the automatic update feature, the way it works is you have a thermostat. Right. And then there's a patch that comes out, and you're, you don't have to do anything. It will, the Nest will tell the, the thermostat to go get the firmware. It gets the firmware, uploads it, it's done. Convenience, right? That's great. The user has to do anything. We use this model in, in the PC world. Your computers do automatic updates, no problem. Even in a non malicious state, like not, not a hacker, maybe the Nest messes up somehow, because we know Microsoft puts out bad updates, get on your mice and keyboard, you, you, you do your thing. What can you do here? If Nest were to put out a bad update, I don't have that luxury. And this is why, what I mean when I say like, the model that we use for the PCs cannot be directly, yes it is running Linux, but it cannot be directly applied to this. I, uh, this is one example, automatic updates. And in, in, in a more malicious sense, let's say I, w I was a bad guy. You've now given this cloud the power to tell every single Nest when to do its business. In the purest of forms, this is a back door. Uh, let's say, like, you know, Facebook gets hacked or LinkedIn or something, you reset a password, right? PR goes out, no big deal. The Nest Cloud gets hacked. The first thing I would do is immediately tell every single Nest I could, hey, go get the update right now. And then no longer connect to the Nest Cloud, connect to mine. Effectively making this good botnet into a bad botnet. And what can Nest do? Uh, they would eventually have to probably update or something, but still, like, the repercussions are much greater in this world. Uh, so that was from the software side. Now the firmware, about a little bit of how it works. So when we started taking it apart, one thing we noticed that it wasn't encrypted, which not a big deal if it was encrypted. Uh, luckily we had the device, we could figure it out. But it, it was signed, which make, presents a problem. That the Nest checks whether 
the firmware coming into it is secure, or it, it, it comes from them, which made it very hard. By the way, this entire thing started was, uh, yes, the, the elegance of security, and I wanted to find that problem out, but I really wanted to change the background, and like I thought, what you'll see in the demo soon would be really cool to have the, the how logo on there. Uh, so the first thing I did, ripped apart the firmware, changed the graphics, put it back together, and it failed. Come to find out that they are, are signing the firmware and prevent that. Uh, the structure of the firmware you, it includes everything. From the bootloader down to the file system, it updates the entire chain, not just any specific device, which is, uh, I mean, take it as you will. Yeah, it, there's no repercussion in that. That's pretty typical as how you would update this. Um, like I already mentioned they did things the right way. Uh, they, are, they are using HTTPS to communicate to the service which is actually a good thing if you think about it. So I don't know exactly how it talks to the Nest Cloud yet. Uh, something you can investigate. But it is a, uh, from a, I guess outsider's perspective that's a good thing. We don't know how that works yet. Uh, and they could be hopefully uh, requiring that that certificate is there to communicate to the cloud. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it for the, now that, yeah, the exciting stuff, the bad stuff they're doing. I've already talked about the automatic updates, but back to that, that whole USB port I was going to go on a tangent off, now I can do that. Um, this USB port is interesting because one thing is to charge it, yeah, okay, but I mean you could have done that a whole bunch of ways. You could have had a, you know, a plug or something. Why would you put this USB port there? And this is where they all started. Uh, I was messing with it, you know, trying all kinds of things. You have to keep in mind this thing is like about this big and the, the pads on there are even smaller so getting into it was really, really hard. Uh, but I did have a USB port. And what ended up happening is after we, we, we poked at it and prodded at it, turns out, uh, and this is very typical for embedded devices, it's not something that, that Nest is doing wrong just because they're Nest and they made a mistake. This is actually happens all across this, this, this industry is they left the entire debugging functionality in the device. Um, and what that means is that if your Nest ever breaks and you ship it back to the, the device, just like I said you don't have a mouse and keyboard, well this gives them a mouse and keyboard to the device. And that's essentially how this all started is we we hooked up, we found out how that, that protocol worked, which is involved holding it down for a certain moment of time, which is what um, Grant's going to talk about. But once you, you, you sort of did this sequence, we figured out that at that one specific moment, it would stop booting from its own thing and go somewhere else. And that's really where, uh, where it all began, at least where I handed it off to these guys. Now, a quick note this is something we have not investigated, but something to keep in mind is that back, that two gigabyte chip, we don't know what's on it, we don't know what it's doing, uh, what, what we do know is that there are logs on it. And again, when I bought a Nest, I, I knew in order for it to be smart it was doing something, but never as severe as, as uh, some of the sort of aggregating all this data and I would like more explanation as to what it's doing. Uh, as a user, you aren't given the option to turn this off. Uh, it's implied that if you want this to thing to be smart, it has to do its business. Again, this goes back to that whole theme is where, what are we sacrificing for the sake of convenience? And to be honest, me personally, I still have this thing running in my house. Like I have two of them. Even though I know that this is bad, it could happen, it's either that I become desensitized or I'm probably still working on it, so I'm probably not going to throw them away, but I know this thing is a little, literally a fly on the wall. If you, if you take a look at it, it is a computer that the user cannot put an antivirus on. They can't do anything. They can't take it anywhere to get it fixed. Worse yet, there's this sort of uh, secret door that if a bad person gets to it, they can go in there and stay there forever. You think about it, this is like a, a, a literal fly on the wall. Because I, I, you might be looking at it as, as them uh, sort of collecting temperature logs or that. No, no, no. Let's be more severe. This is a Wi-Fi device on your network. If I were a bad guy, what I'd be doing is tunneling all your traffic through me, sniffing anything I could find, whether that be credentials, credit cards, anything. And that's horrible because, like, if, if you have a virus on your computer, what do you do? It goes slow, it crashes, whatever. You take it at Best Buy. How the hell are you ever going to know that your thermostat is infected? You won't. Uh, I think that's the end of that rant. Uh, this is a picture of the files. Okay, so before I, I hand it over to, um, to Grant, how many of you, now that you know a little bit about why uh, I did this and, and what it can do and how bad it is, are you honestly going to return the device or not use it? Stop using it. Yeah. So that's something to keep in mind is uh, you guys are making the choices that the next 
30 years of us, our, our children are going to have to endure because we're setting the standard. Hey everybody, thanks Daniel. All right, so I'm gonna start diving into the really nitty gritty details of just like how this device works and uh, what our attack does and how you can do it yourself for your own thermostats and if a malicious attacker had a hold of your thermostat, what they could do with it and let's see. So the processor, TI Sitar AM3703. This thing's a fully featured ARM Cortex-A8 processor. It has, it has works. It's got everything you could have on a desktop or uh, some sort of lightweight device, 64K onboard SRAM, and configurable boot options, which is what we leverage to get root access on the Nest thermostat. So this is a, a little diagram of the flow you would take, or the Nest would thermos, uh, thermostat would take when you're booting. So there's pretty much two main boot modes you have to be familiar with. So peripheral boot and non-peripheral boot. Normally when you're booting up the Nest thermostat, it goes through the, the other route. Um, this route here, it will do the non-peripheral boot. And it loads the uh, bootloaders, the X loader, the U boot, and then it finally loads the kernel. Our route, by using USB, we enter the peripheral boot, which pretty much allows us to upload arbitrary code into memory and execute. So beyond getting root on the Nest file system, we have root on the CPU itself. And there's nothing they can do because this is fixed in the hardware. So here's the normal boot process a little bit more described. So the ROM starts execution. Um, it initializes basic subsystems. So you're starting out like with nothing, like no SD RAM. You have 64K of SRAM. It's pretty small. Um, it then loads the X loader, which is the first second stage bootloader. This is once again bootstrapping and some more, getting some more memory up. And, and then finally it goes to, if you guys are familiar with U-Boot, pretty much the Swiss army knife of embedded like bootloaders. It pretty much has everything you would ever need and it's completely customizable. And because uh, Nest was so nice of, to include the, um, their open source versions of this, including their changes, it was not so difficult to recompile and target with our own modifications. So um, this is where we start our attack. The ROM has a feature that enables anyone to upload code if the boot pins are set correctly. So our attack sets the boot pins and we can upload our code directly into memory, start executing, so there's no chain of trust. There's pretty much just, you just give me code, I run it, and this is where we continue forward. So we have our own custom X loader. Our custom X loader does more of the same things, but it also allows us to chain more files into memory including our own custom U-boot and our custom file system. So we move forward, U-boot goes, executes, and we have our custom environment. So U-boot initializes the kernel with kernel arguments which can pretty much allow us to choose our file systems, choose our init scripts, go forward from there and get full access to the device. Executes the same Linux kernel because, you know, it's working. There's no need to upload our own. Just we just want our scripts to backdoor the existing installation. And finally, our new user land, our backdoored user land for the Nest is loaded. Having anything we'd want, anything that could be possibly written for a Linux system. So um, here's an in-depth explanation of why this happens. So there are six pins determining the boot sequence that are a feature of the processor. So Nest has a convenient feature export it to USB that pretty much allows you to do arbitrary uploads and to activate this feature, they've also included a s automatic switch so that when you hold it down for 10 seconds, the button I mean, it will enter into the bottom mode. And the bottom mode, as you can see, starts with USB and from there it doesn't continue because we are uploading our code. Normally it starts with NAND flash which has all of our code, on, has Nest code already so you'd never make it to USB even though it's second. So device programming. Um, the first five pins are fixed in hardware. Um, they're literally um, pulled to ground or pulled to five volts. And the fifth pin is what's variable and it is affected by the power control manager so that when you have a hardware like hold down the, for 10 seconds which is controlling the hardware, not the software. So it's not something you can patch. 
Um, and also, conveniently, the pin is exported on an unpopulated header, so you could do it that way, but that requires you to open the device. So, to, so how do we figure this out? How do we discover this at all? So pretty much using Wireshark, um, while booting the Nest, we did a packet capture and we saw this uh, USB device descriptor. Uh, this is Nest specific device descriptor. As you can see, it doesn't populate with any strings because I guess they either made it up, I looked it up, can't find anything. But all of that means is that it's unique and not that interesting. But when you hold it down for 10 seconds and it reboots, this is what comes up. So the chip is a TI chip and this pretty much is documented in the data sheet. If you see this descriptor, this means you're talking directly to the boot ROM of the CPU. So that means you can then enter into programming mode, do reading its configuration, setting its configuration. This is what we leverage to get root access. So implications, I mean, like, so it's a thermostat, right? But this has a lot more implications than a normal thermostat because it's very intelligent. It has a lot of processing capability and away detection, you know, like network credentials, zip code stuff, like this is all on the device. I mean, this is already there. You can just scrape it off and just like send it off to your servers. Like, so um, remote exfiltration is something else. I mean, it's a node on your network. It's connected to your Wi-Fi you're controlling from your phone. But you can then use normal attacks against networks like ARP spoofing to pretty much get traffic further, further your maybe like pivot to other devices. So it's more than, it's a little bit more scary than something uh, less, uh, less smart. Um, control over Nest devices. This Nest talks to the cloud. It has OAuth tokens, OAuth secrets. You can just scrape these off, take them to your, somewhere else and use them and remotely control their devices. Whatever is available. I mean, at this, you wouldn't have to do this, right? You have, you can drop a back door that would give you arbitrary control, but something else. You can brick the device. Um, not really as useful as the other things because you just lost the device. But uh, persistent malware, um, they do not patch uh, the X loader because that is the second stage bootloader. If you mess that up and you break it, you never start again and you have to send it back. So that's something you could hide your stuff in there. Uh, so without further ado, let's talk about the attack. Um, pretty much what I just said, you hold it down for 10 seconds, you've plugged in USB already, you have a listener on your machine that is waiting for this special device ID, the Texas Instruments device ID to appear. You reset it and then within like less than five seconds, you've uploaded your code, you unplug, you put it back in the wall, you put it back in the box, you send it back to the store, whatever you want to do. Like at that point, you've already uploaded your code, you've already gotten root, you can do anything you want because you've mounted the file system that exists and you've now put your own stuff. So our custom X loader, all does, chain loads U-boot and the init file system. Custom U-boot initializes the existing kernel, in place kernel, and will uh, change the arguments so we can, up, we can run our own file system, run our own scripts, move from there. RAM disk mounts the nest file system. We can write anything and everything and arbitrary script code execution just through USB and from this point you could just put like some bootstrap program and you drop anything else. Um, Netcat already comes in the nest so yeah, if you're looking to bootstrap like your way onto the device, there you go. So refining a backdoor, like so, like Netcat, like okay, Netcat, it's pretty simple, not much we can do with that. So we need to target this device and this platform for furthering our, our execution, like how much can we do? So we want to rebuild and target the device with the tool chain. So we cross compile our own GCC and from this we can cross compile drop bear which is just a lightweight SSH server common in embedded devices. SSH in, familiar terminal, you know, have interactive commands, everything we love and add users and groups, reset, reset password. I mean honestly anything at this point, drop our own malware, drop, um, redo the configuration, add exfiltration, anything you can think of. Uh, Linux kernel modification, uh, we could go even further, we could uh, create a malicious module that would, let's say, let's say they're trying to do an auto update but you don't want to lose persistence. Uh, they do an auto update, you hide some files. You prevent some files from being written to it, you say, hey, you did write to this but you really didn't, 
It's, you can do anything custom logo if, you're, if you want to have something a little special if you reboot your thermostat, which wouldn't happen often. Um, debugging capabilities and uh, pretty much polling on the serial ports, so giving yourself some more functionality. And so here we are. It's ready to do the demo, and pretty much I'll be showing getting root and some little graphics that I made for the Nest to show you can pretty much do anything with it. Okay, here now comes the most exciting part. Uh, no. All right. So I'm going to be demonstrating just getting root on the Nest thermostat by running the scripts that I've created to pretty much um, automatically backdoor and start the thermostat. So let's go ahead and do that. So I have some scripts to uh, automatically create an image. And because I'm all on the same Wi Fi network, um, pretty much all I need is my current IP address. I mean, this, of course, you could use as a server in the cloud, but for demonstration purposes, you know, you know standard port number. So creates this back door. It'll just create an image for us to start running as our file system. And we can then run the exploit command with the arguments. Oops. And at this point, it's, it's already listening. So I have the nest here. And nothing's running on it. I've disabled the Nest uh, software, so for demonstration purposes, I could re-enable it, and you'll see it running, and also other stuff. So at this point, all I need to do, I just need to just hold this down for 10 seconds, and it'll reset. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, I really do want to show you the my screen, so I'll just pretend I am holding this down for 10 seconds here. So I'm holding it down, and and you'll see it will discover the new USB device. Once it's reset, there it is, discovered it. It's now uploading my code into memory and it's gonna start executing, boom. So waiting for my connect back at this point. And now I can show you that I really do not need USB to connect, be connected at this point. I could have just you know, put this back, back plate here, you know, not a big deal, no problem. So now on my computer side, go ahead and start up a Netcat listener. Just, uh, it's got to boot up first, but oh, here it is. It's already here. So, Netcat listener, root shell, connected directly to my machine, could be my server. Um, yeah, root on the Nest thermostat right there. And as you can see, we have Nest Labs directory there. They have some interesting stuff. I'm just going to show you the directory. There it is. There's some of their programs there. Um, you could download uh, firmware online to do this yourself. So now let me just show you some of the other stuff we've created. Um, so here's the actual Nest thermostat software running. I'll let Daniel hold that. And I'm going to go ahead and disable this software. So pretty much I have a little script to enter a test mode. And it'll like stop the scripts as they're running, and you'll see this say, "Oh, ready to restart." There we go. So I've just stopped the scripts, and now I can start running my own code. So I've also dropped an SSH. Uh, I've also dropped a drop bear. So um, I can go ahead and just SSH to that and um, run our demos here. Okay, let's. So, this thing always kind of reminded me of HAL 9000, and our researcher Orlando um, has created some interesting demos uh, alongside mine. And um, I'll go ahead and show you the first one. It's a fractal image. One second. So, anyone who's familiar with fractals knows this is the Julia set running on Nest thermostat, uh, all software, uh, software rendering. There's no OpenGL here. There's no 2D, 3D frame buffer acceleration. It just doesn't exist. Um, so that's fun to watch. And one other thing. What the? 
this always kind of reminded me of a 2001 Space Odyssey, so uh, might as well show this. Yeah, there you go. There's the quotes. I don't know if you can read that, but yeah, thanks to Orlando for designing that. It's uh, quite clever. And finally, our last little demo. Um, just some other graphical animation, you know, like standard, like, you know, <laughs> digital rain, you know, nothing, nothing too fancy. Um, so this was just kind of a fun thing that we did because, you know, at this point, you'd want to, like, customize it any way you want. And you can do it because it's not just your standard wall thermostat. It's a Linux system. You have, you have full control. And, uh, oh, yes, uh, so 3D doesn't exist, but it can be easily, like, kind of simulated in software if it's not too many triangles or anything. But yeah. So uh, with this, uh, we'll just let this run for a little bit more. There's uh, one more last thing at the end. It's just a little, tiny little demo. It's, um, and then I'll hand it back off to you. And yeah. So this one's uh, kind of a, it's hard, a bit hard to see, but this is like a star field. I don't know if you can see that. And as I turn it, I can like go through the star field. And if I press it, I can like go through this like starfield tunnel, like you know, like oh, like thermostat, like here, like what's going on? So go through the tunnel. Yeah, so I've had some fun with this thing. Uh, it's it's been a bit. Uh, we've hacked it. We've hacked away at this for a while. But yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed. We're turning it off to yours for the conclusion. Okay, so. Very nice presentation. I don't know like what you will feel, what's your feeling when you go back home and see your Nest thermostat showing your hello day or like telling you that some 3D things goes on. Um, but before we rush into the conclusion that, okay, these guys, they hack the device, let's take it in the positive view. So with this device, we kind of like have the root access now, if for someone who re really care or about their pers uh, privacy, this gives you the weapon. So now, through this root access, you can turn off the feature that your Nest thermostat will not upload any information to the Nest server. So, and that's the reason Orlando is not here the fourth, um, another of my students. He's busy with to wrap things up and to provide a patch. This will be released soon so that everyone can download the patch from our website. Just one click, then your Nest is secured and functional. It will still auto update stuff, but it will never upload your privacy to the Nest server. Uh, surely, like, we still need to take it in the negative view that if some hackers trying to explore this one, they can now get into your, if they can have physical access to the device, now they can remotely control your device. And they can, they can learn your privacy and learn your style. And also, through this Nest thermostat, they can attack other devices in your smart house. But the other relief to Nest Lab and what we learned from Nest is that they are, they're no willing to repair this this back door because they claim that we need a physical care to the device and it is even though the remote attack is still under investigation. Uh, one quick solution, I'm sure there will be many solutions available, but I do want to emphasize here is that the, this back door, it happened on hardware. So any level of firmware patch based on our knowledge should not help to alleviate this problem which means only hardware level protection can help. And this is one of our solution, which means we call the chain of trust. So we claim that the hardware must do code authentication for the first stage bootloader before it runs. And we also claim or we suggest to recommend the public key cryptography. For most of the wearable device, this may cost too much, but for a device like Nest thermostat, power is not a constraint. So we claim that all of the code should be either encrypted or signed before it runs. So only through this way, not just for Nest thermostat, this is the best protected device. For all other IoT devices which will come in the future, we highly recommend that they take the, at least take some of the idea here to build the chain of trust 
when they build the hardware device. Then comes the, conclusion, can, uh, comes the conclusion. So we claim that we break into the NEST device, but we still need to admit that NEST did a lot of things in the right way, so that until now we still not find any way to remotely attack the device. For the future work, we will definitely invest further of the NEST thermostat, and we are looking for other devices also. And we will emphasize that we were trying to apply our tool chain of trust and trying to build some uh, prototype for what we call highly secure devices. Okay, here comes conclude our work. Thanks. <laughs> Any questions? Oh, one more thing. Please don't forget to fill in the review form. We appreciate it for any comments of that. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, it's working? Yeah, it's working. Uh, are there any privacy concerns with the onboard sensors? Uh, you kind of glossed over that when you were talking about your hardware. What, what sensors are on there, like, uh, I assume it's temperature? Two motion sensors. And in really, you know, if anything that I said, and thank for you guys that are still here, this was much, at, when I first started this, it was an exploit. That's all it was. But as I delve deeper, I spent over a year with this device. It was more than that. It was about the fact that we are giving up our privacy to this device and don't know nothing about it. And it's not a big deal now, but this is the pattern that everyone else is. This is Google. And if they're doing right. it, I mean. But I mean, you said motion sensor, is it? Yeah, yeah, the motions. I mean, it has two the motion sensors one for near field and far field detection. So it tells you when you're in front of it and when you enter the room. Okay, like PIR? Or what? Uh, oh, oh, yeah, we have access to that. I mean, yeah. Passive infrared is. What? There. I mean, like that's passive infrared. Is it, that's on there. Oh, uh, I mean, I don't know how it does it, but okay. I mean, it it, it tells you. Okay. I don't know the exact I mean, type. It's just like it has drivers for this, like Lynx kernel. So like you, if you know how to interface with it, you could right. just read it, or you could wait for Nest to read it and just yeah. read it from them. So it's it's all accessible. You have full control over this thing. All right. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. No problem. Yes, hi. Uh, I just want to reiterate that you know that uh, you need a physical access of the uh, of the device to break into it, and it's just as uh, hard as you know getting. It's just like getting you know access to your home. So I mean, people don't need to. No, be, no, no. Be, oh, people not. Okay. No, sorry, let me complete. People yeah. not need, need not be you know scared of this because they need access to your home to break into this. Yeah. It, and then it just becomes just like you know jail breaking an iPhone. You know. To, so that you, you can, you know, upload your own operating system onto it, you can run Linux onto it. So then, you know, the, it's just like, you know, going into that direction. Mm -hmm. But I think, and even if you want to do a remote attack, you know, first you need to, you know, get the access to it and then, you know, uh, put yeah. your own uh, uh, Linux kernel and then be able to connect it, you know, remotely. So I think uh, this, f this physical impediment is, is one thing, you know, that uh, Nest has done very well. And, and, and why they have left the door open for you to run all of this is because they want to up, remotely update the device through, uh, for, you know, for updates and, th and things like that. So, I mean, uh, they, can, they can control this feature uh, in the future, but the thing is, uh, then wh who's going to update, you know, uh, with the new uh, Nest features? And I think that's what you are exporting. But then it, 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 it's not, nothing fancy, fancy because uh, it, then, it then just becomes, you know, just like jailbreaking an iPhone kind of a thing. So I just wanted to hear yeah. your thoughts. No, no, Thank I mean, you. I apologize for interrupting you. Uh, that's, that's, that's a good question, and it's true. You need physical access. But understand is that, I mean, it doesn't even have to break into your house. I could buy 20 of these, sell them all to eBay, and you'd have them in your house, and you would never know. That's the point is that 20 people all having this thing in their house, I can sniff a lot of stuff on there. In fact, I can sell that to someone else, and they sniff, so. Yeah, I mean, you do need physical access for now, but uh, you can always do that. Yeah, good point. Thank you. Yeah, yeah well, actually, oh, okay. There we go, yeah. Is this still, <laughs> I don't know if this is being recorded, but uh, yeah, so there are ways you can get a hold of them. Low sells them too, and uh, if you were to modify them, put them back, and they would sell them again. Uh, okay. At a discount too, so someone will probably buy it. <laughs> go ahead. All right, I, I'm very interested in one part of the talk that you didn't continue, which is, with this access you have to this device, now you can uh, reverse engineer the WIV protocol. Yes. Um, how far have you gone to understanding that protocol? Because what I am very concerned okay. and is that uh, most of these people using the Internet of Things are using these closed protocols that we understand their security and they claim that everything is fine because they do it. Right. But for me it's very concerning that and why Google has not moved 
from this protocol, which is closed, to something more open. So we, we do know this about the protocol. Um, it's just JSON, REST API stuff. Um, it's secured to OAuth, and so what's happening with the protocol? Well, we didn't want to, we wanted to uh, cut off our scope um, in evaluating the protocol because that would require us to interact with Nest servers. And the reason is that we are a hardware security lab and we really wanted to focus on the device and its hardware and the, I guess the software running on the device as well. But I have to say that I have been using Ida Pro to reverse engineer the Nest client. I'm trying to get more insight into like if there's anything more severe and I'm hoping that uh, in the future I can have some more future work on this. Well, I, I'm not talking about, only about that, but the, the Zigbee knockoff that they use for the other... Oh, you're training. talking about the Zigbee? The Zigbee, that, you said Zigbee. that you use a Zigbee, um, different protocol than Zigbee, right? A modified protocol? Oh, yeah, so the, the Zigbee protocol, like, it, it, it has a Zigbee, but they're, they have, like, a proprietary, like, like, format on top of Zigbee's physical thing. So, like, it's, it's a Zigbee, like, you know... It uses the 802.15.4 radio spec and just builds on top of that. So yeah. uses, uh, the, the Zigbee chip they use allows for proprietary uh, implementations, like, like what they're doing. Like they have their own firmware on the Zigbee device, but just getting, uh, getting into that is a little bit more difficult because so, the tools required is a little bit, the bar is a little bit higher on that one. Okay. Was that, did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? I think um, one more. Uh, we have one and we are looking into it. <laughs> So that's, that, I guess that's up to... That's um, a very good question. Yeah. So we've been thinking of this one. So the first version would be just to like stop uploading the data, private, privacy. But the second version, because the Nest, they will collect two types of data. One is the system like log, the other is the user log. We will like separate this data and only provide something Nest may using for your weekly or monthly report and keep your other privacy. Nest will learn too much, we will say those we kind of can remove this too much part. So, I mean, that's a very good point. Thanks. But ideally, though, the point is you should not install our patch. Like, uh, you, you trust me, I'm up here, but ideally the, the whole goal with that is, is that at least Nest, I mean, hopefully they'll listen, we'll provide them the source code, and they implement it so that way you keep your features. That's the goal. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the source code... It's all oh. You mean Let, let's put it offline. We the source code is something we're really concerned because if we release all the source, and anyone no, can explore the tools, it. The tools. Yeah, the whole tool chain is too powerful because the tool chain we build is way more than Nest thermostat they use. And you can see from the demo, Nest thermostat their tool chain cannot run this 3D or stuff on it because they do not support that. But we support that. But we are kind of afraid that if we release the whole tool train, what would be outcome of this? So this is something we are thinking about. Thanks. But yes. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the exciting part, right? Like you could jailbreak your, your, your thermostat. Yeah. yeah. Yes. You should be able to. Right. Yes. Yeah. All right. Oh, okay. No, no, we're not working with them. To, to fix this entire thing, they would require you to replace, it's a hardware level bug, the debugger, so it would require them to replace every single nest. The patch would allow you to choose about the whole data thing, uh, to, to whether to send that off or not. Yeah, not with nest. Yeah, so hopefully they, we've done, you know, a portion of the work and all they have to do is add their secret sauce to make it legitimate. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah, uh, so the question. Oh, you, you yeah. go ahead. Yeah, well, uh, just because I, I bro broken on. This is my last one. I broke. I uh, broke on. Uh, if that makes any sense. I broken on like the Belkin, the Quick Set. Um, the thing is, is that with Google, man, this stupid mic. Okay. So the question was, other devices have we looked at? Yes. The answer. Some answer was yes. And here's the thing. Nest is the most secure of all. They do everything by the book. I'm talking about when the Heartbleed exploit came out, they updated their own version of it, you know, within days of the, of the thing. 
why? I mean, who, it's not even running a server or anything. So, I, I mean, it, yeah. Uh, these are, this is the best you can get in regards to security posture, and even they had this bug. So, I remember this, these flaws. The thing is, you're always going to find a bug in them. Like, like, I mean, it's a wasted effort. We wanted to pick the best one and show how, if, if they can fall, so can all the other ones. Uh, let's take some, any other questions we'll take outside, offline. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Thank you. If you have any questions, let's keep it offline. <laughs>